Hello and welcome to Solved, where we help you solve problems. In this video, we will be discussing steady state heat conduction through resistances in series for a cylindrical system. Let's go on and start with the problem. Saturated steam at 40 PSIA flows at 5 feet per second through a 4 inch Schedule 40 steel pipe with a given thermal conductivity of 26 BTU per hour per feet per degrees Fahrenheit. The convective heat transfer coefficient by condensing steam on the inside surface may be taken as 1,500 BTU per hour per square feet per degrees Fahrenheit. The surrounding air is at 80 degrees Fahrenheit and the outside surface coefficient is 3 BTU per hour per square feet per degrees Fahrenheit. Determine the following. First, the heat loss per 10 feet of bare pipe. Second, the heat loss per 10 feet of pipe insulated with 2 millimeters of rubber. And lastly, the maximum possible thickness of insulation. Let's go ahead and solve that problem. Here we have the collection of given for our problem. We have saturated steam at 40 pounds per square inch absolutes flowing inside of a pipe. This is the cross section of the pipe represented here with internal radius R sub O and external radius R sub I. We want to determine the heat loss through 10 feet of this pipe, so our length is equal to 10 feet. Now, before we proceed any further, let's first determine the actual internal diameter of the pipe. Remember that our given is 4 inch Schedule 40 pipe. The given 4 inches here as the diameter is called the nominal diameter and it is not the actual diameter of the pipe. For the actual diameter of the pipe, we have to take a look at our handbook. The actual diameters of commercial steel pipes with different schedules are given in Chapter 10 of Perry's Chemical Engineer's Handbook, 8th edition. And it is under Process Plant Piping. If you take a look at Table 10-22, you see here the given nominal pipe size in inches, so we look for the 4 inches. And we want to determine both the inside diameter and the outside diameter. So we are given 4 inch schedule 40. Here is 4 inch nominal diameter and the schedule number 40. So we now know that the outer diameter is 4.5 inches and the inside diameter is 4.026 inches. From the given values of the actual inside and outside diameter of the pipe, we can determine the outside and inside radius as 2.25 inches and 2.013 inches respectively. Next, we would like to take a look at the temperatures. We are given the surrounding temperature on the outside of the pipe that is 80 degrees Fahrenheit. However, we were not given the temperature inside of the pipe. The only data that we were given is that it contains saturated steam at 40 PSIA. Now, we know that this is saturated steam. And if we take a look at the steam table of water, we can convert its saturation pressure to its saturation temperature. Let's first convert PSIA to megapascals. 40 PSIA divided by 14.7 PSI is to 1 atmosphere. And 1 atmosphere is equal to 0 0.101325 megapascals. We get a saturation pressure of 0 0.278 megapascals. It is this saturation pressure that we will use to determine the saturation temperature of our steam. So let's take a look at the steam table. The steam tables are given in Chapter 2 of the handbook under thermodynamic properties. So we look for the thermodynamic properties of water. So for table 2-305, the first part here is for saturated liquid water. And the second part here is for saturated vapor. All we need to do is to find where our saturation pressure lies and then determine what is the corresponding saturation temperature. Our saturation pressure, 0 0.278 megapascals, falls between 400 and 410 Kelvin. So we have to interpolate between these two values. Upon interpolation, we have determined that the steam temperature inside is 403.5 Kelvin. Now we are ready to draw the equivalent circuit diagram of this system. So for the first part of this problem, we are considering a bare pipe, meaning it has no insulation. Its equivalent resistance can be drawn as a circuit containing three resistances in series. 
the first resistance, R1, will be due to convection inside of the pipe. The second resistance, R2, will be due to conduction on the wall of the pipe. And the last resistance, R3, will be due to convection on the outside of the pipe. That's why we are given both the inside and the outside convection heat transfer coefficients. Our expression for the rate of heat transfer will be Q sub R, or the rate of radial heat transfer, is equal to, on the numerator, we have the driving force. The overall driving force here will be the temperature of the steam minus the surrounding temperature outside of the pipe. And then in our denominator, we simply get the sum of the resistances. The first resistance R1, again, is due to convection. So we write its resistance as 1 over HI AI, wherein A sub I is the internal surface area of the pipe, plus R2. R2 is the resistance brought by the wall of the pipe. So for cylindrical systems, we write the resistance as LN of RO over RI over 2 pi k l and then the last resistance is due to convection on the outside of the pipe we write it as 1 over h o a o wherein a sub o is the outer surface area of the pipe okay and before we substitute our given let's first remember that the lateral surface area of a cylinder is equal to 2 pi r l if we want to get the inner surface area of the pipe, we use the inner radius, R sub i. And if we want the outer surface area of the pipe, we use the outer radius, R sub o. Solving for QR, let's first solve for the resistance terms at the bottom because it will not fit in our calculator. So let's start with R1. That is 1 over H sub i, 1500, multiplied by A sub i, or the internal surface area. That is 2 pi times the internal radius, 2.013 divided by 12. I converted it to inches for dimensional homogeneity, multiplied by the length of the pipe, 10 feet. Plus, for the next term, we have ln of RO over RI, that is 2.25 over 2.013. No need to convert them to feet because the conversion factors will just cancel anyway. Okay, And that is over 2 pi. K, or the thermal conductivity of the pipe, 26 times the length of the pipe, 10 feet. Plus, for the last term, we have 1 over H sub O is 3 times the outer surface area of the pipe, that is 2 pi times the outer radius, 2.25 divided by 12 to convert it to feet, times 10 feet for the length. This is our total resistance. Now, all we have to do is to divide our driving force with this resistance. So we have 726.3 Rankine minus 540 Rankine divided by our resistance term. Therefore, our rate of heat transfer is 6,553.95 BTU per R. This is for the bare pipe. For the next part, we want to see what will happen to the rate of heat transfer if we place 2 millimeters thick of rubber insulation to our pipe. So let me first erase some of this and then we will proceed to the second part. For the second part of the problem, we are adding another conductive resistance. That means that our total resistances are now 4. So I will be modifying our equivalent resistance diagram to include the fourth resistance. So we now say that R1 and R4 are the resistances due to convection on the inside and the outside of the pipe, respectively. And then R2 represents the resistance brought by the pipe itself. And then R3 represents the resistance of the additional insulating material. It was stated in the problem that we are adding 2 millimeters thick of rubber as our insulator. What happens to our system if you add an insulator? First, the total radius increases because we are placing another layer into our pipe. So we now say that for our rubber insulation, its inner radius R sub 1 is equal to the outer radius of the pipe, meaning they have intimate contact. So this is 2.25 inches. Now for the outer radius of the rubber, we simply need to add 2 millimeters, that is the thickness, to the internal radius of the rubber. So that is 2.25 inches plus 2 millimeters divided by 25.4, the conversion factor between millimeters and inches. Our outer radius is now 2.33 inches. 
Next, we need to determine the thermal conductivity of rubber because the thermal conductivity is an important part of the resistance term for R3. So let's take a look at the handbook for the thermal conductivity of rubber. Here on table 2-326, we see that for rubber, we have three types, that hard, para, and soft. Let's just assume that this is hard rubber. Its thermal conductivity is 0 0.087 BTU per hour per feet per degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, now that we have the thermal conductivity, we are now ready to construct our rate of heat transfer equation. That is QR is equal to, we still have the same driving force, so that is still the steam temperature inside minus the surrounding temperature outside. However, in our denominator, we just need to add more terms. So R1 is still due to convection inside. This is 1 over HIAI plus R2 is for the wall of the pipe. That is LN of RO over RI over 2 pi K1L. K1 meaning that is the thermal conductivity of the pipe. Plus for the layer of insulation, we have LN of R2 over R1 all over 2 pi K2L. K2 meaning the thermal conductivity of rubber. Plus the last term due to the convection outside, 1 over HOAO. Okay, so let's first solve for the total of the resistances. We have 1 over HI, 1,500, times 2 pi R sub I, 2.013 over 12, times length, that is 10, ln of RO over RI, 2.25 over 2.013, over 2 pi K1, 26, times length, 10 meters, plus the contribution of rubber, that is LN of R2 over R1, 2.33 over 2.25, divided by 2 pi times K2 for rubber, 0 0.087 times length, 10 meters. Plus the contribution of the convection outside, that is 1 over HO, 3 times AO, that is 2 pi, RO now becomes 2.33 inches because this is now the new outer surface of our system. So this is 2.33 over 12 times the length of the pipe 10 feet. So this is our total resistance. And again, we simply divide our temperature difference with our resistance. So we have 726.3 Rankine minus 540 Rankine divided by the sum of our resistances. Our rate of heat transfer is now 5,504.41 BTU per hour. This is the rate of heat transfer for the insulated pipe. If we compare this to the rate of heat loss of the bare pipe, we have earlier determined that that is 6553.95 BTU per hour. And we now see the effectiveness of our insulation layer. Our thin layer of insulation has proven that we can lower our rate of heat loss from the bare pipe from 6,500 down to 5,500. That reduction in the rate of heat transfer is due to our additional resistance term in our equation, and that is due to the insulation. Let's first erase some parts of this and then regroup for the last part of the problem. The last part of the problem asks us to determine the maximum thickness of the insulation. Now for a slab system, the thicker the insulation you place, the less your heat loss would be. That's because a thicker insulator translates to a higher resistance to heat transfer. However, the same is not true for cylindrical systems such as pipes. There will come a time wherein your insulator gets thicker and thicker, your surface area outside actually gets larger. And the net effect would be your heat loss would be greater than that of the bare pipe. So it is important for us to determine what is the optimum or what is the critical thickness of the insulator needed. For that purpose, we are only going to consider the resistances R3 and R4 for our Q. That's because R3 pertains to the resistance of the insulator, while R4 pertains to the resistance due to convection outside. So we write our heat expression as Q is equal to the driving force we simply call delta T. That's simply the temperature here at the junction. Let's say it's temperature 1 minus the surrounding temperature at the outside of the pipe. And then the resistances will be, first for the insulator, 
we have ln of R2 over R1, wherein R2 minus R1 is the thickness of the insulator, divided by 2 pi K2L. Remember that K2 is the thermal conductivity of the insulator layer. Plus, for the convection, that is 1 over HO multiplied by the outer surface area of the pipe, that is 2 pi R2L. Now, in order for us to determine the critical thickness of our insulator, what we need to get is the first derivative of Q with respect to R2 and then equate that to 0, solve for the value of R2, and there we have the critical thickness of our insulation. Now, this is not a complicated derivative to accomplish, but the simplification and the obtaining of the roots of the resulting first derivative are very difficult. So using a computing engine, we determined that the first derivative of Q with respect to R2, when equated to 0, would give us a value of R2 as K2 over H. Now that we have the value of the critical point, we need to know if this is a maximum or a minimum point because that will be important in our interpretation. So to determine if this is a maximum or a minimum point, we simply get the second derivative of Q with respect to R and we simply take a look if the collection of terms are positive or negative. Now from the computing engine, we determine that the result of this is a negative value and that means that our critical point is actually a maximum point. What we mean by this is this value of R2 will give us the maximum amount of heat transfer. And for our system, we don't want to have the maximum amount of heat transfer. So we do want a lower heat transfer because lower heat transfer translates to lower heat losses. If we try to solve for the value of R2 in our case, that would be K2 over H, K2 being the thermal conductivity of rubber, that is 0 0.087 BTU per hour per foot per degrees Fahrenheit over the convection coefficient for the outside, that is 3 BTU per hour per square feet per degrees Fahrenheit, you see from the cancellation of units that R2 would have a unit of feet. Solving, that is 0 0.029 feet or converting to inches, that is 0 0.348 inches. Converting this to millimeters, we have 8.84 millimeters. So how do we interpret this value of R2? We say that if the value of R2 is 8.84 millimeters, the rate of heat transfer is maximum. Now, if you exceed the value of this R2, that means that your rate of heat transfer would be lower than the maximum value. Because remember, the maximum value of Q exists at a value of R2 that is equal to K2 over H. And from the previous part of the problem, we know that the value of R2 is 2.33 inches. This is after the application of the 2 millimeter thick insulator. And since R2 is greater than our critical value, that means that our rate of heat transfer would be lower than if we are at the critical value of R2. And that's a good thing because we know that upon application of the insulator, our rate of heat transfer would go down. Now we just do the opposite if we want to maximize the amount of heat transfer such as in heat exchangers. In that case, we might want our R2 to have the value of 8.84 millimeters. That is how we interpret the critical thickness. Thank you for watching, and this has been another problem solved. Yeah.